Firstly, uh, my apologies. I formatted my uh, PowerPoint in the wrong format. So I've just put it into another way and some of the text will be a little bit little. Um, so if you can see the screens uh, either side, that'll be easier than this one because it's a long way away and uh, you'll probably see it better on those TV screens. Is that okay? Yeah, it's interesting some of the songs and the way that Jeff introduced uh, by storytelling about Jesus setting his face like a flint. Uh, this is the theme of what I'd like to speak about today. And firstly, I will uh, speak from Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50 is one of the servant songs of Isaiah. And there are four of them in chapter 42, 49, 50, and the most famous ones in chapter 53. Uh, and it talks in its, the, the prophesying of the servant coming, the Messiah servant who we know as Jesus. And this, uh, these prophecies are nearly 800 years before Jesus arrives on the scene. And uh, I think they're pretty special prophecies if you like Isaiah, uh, it's a fantastic book. So I'm going to read just 10 verses of chapter 50. Now, when you see some of the initial verses, they'll be a little bit confusing, but it's God talking about Israel <clears throat> and then about the servant is of Israel who we know as Christ. So let's crack on and see what these say. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to, to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that I cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's... Oops, that's the wrong one. Is that it? There it is. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turn not backward of my creditors. Of my creditors, is it to whom I have sold you? Isn't this confusing? Yeah, it is. That's all right. We're not going to cover this bit today. It would take a while. But I just wanted to get the context. Behold, for your iniquities you were sold. Oh, this is what we've already done, isn't it? No, for your iniquities you have already sold, and I've lost a battery out of this thing. It's fallen out because I'm playing with it. Verse 5, yeah. And for your transgressions, your mother was sent away. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. Now, this starts to get to the crux of the servant and the prophecy of what Jesus faced in his life. I hid not my face from disgrace, disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who dwell, uh, walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. 
And so we see this passage that can be a little confusing without giving good explanation, but I want to really concentrate on the fact that this is the song of the servant, the suffering servant, the suffering of Messiah. And in verse 7, the servant expresses his complete confidence in God declaring that he will not shrink back from his mission despite severe suffering, opposition, humiliation. He says, because the Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Because the Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint And I know that I shall not be put to shame. Now, flint is a rock. When we talk about flint stones, we don't talk about Fred and Wilma or Betty and Barney or Dino the the pet dinosaur. (laughs) We're talking about something that comes from the earth. A flint stone, if you've ever seen a flint stone, when it's uh, shaped and fashioned and bits break off, it breaks off in pieces that make it very sharp, sharp on the edges. And so a flint stone is used often for an arrowhead or a knife in in times past, and it is an excellent uh, stone to use as an arrowhead. It's a very hard, dark rock, although some of it comes in a lighter colour is used figuratively in the Bible to express hardness. Firstly, in uh, Isaiah, the firmness of horses' hooves. In Deuteronomy and Psalms, the toughness of an impossible task. And in Ezekiel, the inflexibility of unwavering determination. Flintstones... Was that a signal, Dave? Oh, he went like that. No, what's he saying? Yeah. So a flint stone, when you strike it against each other, uh, causes a spark. That's why some people are more like flint stones. <laughs> Call them sparky. Um, <laughs> and so when a, a flint stone was fashioned in the form of a Uh, arrowhead and it was bound to the shaft and it was balanced properly when it hit the target it was deadly and that's what the whole aim was at the hands of the archer what a weapon now set your face like a flint is a figure of speech And the prophet uses this figure of speech to describe the Messiah's unwavering determination to persevere in the excruciating task set before him. In this time of Lent, in this time of walking towards Easter, we remember that Jesus walked towards Easter and he had this unwavering determination to get to the task that God had set before him. For Jesus wasn't just appearing, he was sent by the Father to perform what he was supposed to do. He would endure humiliation on his journey to the cross to die for our sins. And nearly those 800 years before him, Isaiah foretold the suffering. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. For us, we don't get persecution, really. We got it easy peasy and therefore we're comfortable. Sadly, we become like fat babies, don't we? Sometimes. Well, in our spiritual lives, we do sometimes because we're not opposed so much. We are a little bit, but sometimes in our Western world, in our Western places, 
we can become a little bit too comfortable. And I reckon, well, maybe I'll get onto that after. Now, staying on track in the Christian life requires setting our faces like a flint, an arrowhead pointing towards where Jesus would have us be. And the Apostle Paul teaches us to run that race with our eyes and the prize. He set his face like a flint to finish his course. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards the goal, the, what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He set his face like a flint. Nothing more was more important to Paul than completing his God-given mission, no matter what the cost. In Acts, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. That's what he was assigned to do. Telling people the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So when we're in this period of Lent, how does this all gel together? What is this season that we call Lent? It's a traditional a season, a number of 40 days beforehand, that the church recognises and leads people in a place often in prayer and fasting, uh, a place that is a denying of self and recommitment of, of life to Christ. Lent's often described as a preparation and an opportunity to go deeper with God. This means that it's a time of for personal re reflection that prepares us and prepares our hearts and minds ready for the remembering of the crucifixion, but not just the crucifixion primarily, to remember the resurrection. It's a time of solemnity, of self-reflection. It's a time sometimes to deny ourselves of luxuries or some, something like that, to concentrate our minds and our hearts towards God, where we confess our failings and resolve to live a life more godly, based on the teachings and the life of Jesus. My focus today is the life of Jesus. In his obedience to the purpose. The purpose to which he was sent by God the Father to complete his mission, to give his life as a ransom on our behalf so that it opens the way for us to become new creation to be reconciled with God and to be recipients of God's forgiveness and his mercy and his power to be able to serve him. We talk about Jesus out of Matthew. Oops, sorry. I, this is what... Um, did I miss? I missed poor old Charles Spurgeon. He's all right. We'll just have a look. He was a pretty good preacher, I think. My great object is to lead you to love him so, who so loved you that he set his face like a flint in his determination to save you. O oh, you redeemed ones on whose behalf this strong resolve was made, you who have been bought by the precious blood of this steadfast, resolute redeemer, come and think a while of him that your hearts may burn within you and that your faces may be set like flints to live and die for him who lived and died for you. How often do we need to have our hearts burn for Jesus? Whatever happened to 
people who were aflame, who were bonfires, not just a candle, but a bonfire for Jesus. Oh, so often we just get comfortable in our own lives, in our own programs, in our own schedules, and, and the burning for Jesus gets a little bit less. Oh, that we would burn for Jesus, that we would ha- be on fire for him. I'm sure that's what Spurgeon was encouraging his people in that portion of his, his um, sermon that I took that quote from. Jesus. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, and this is alluded to by Jeff's beginning today, uh, that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside. Here we are. That's us. This is it. Don't think it's just Peter. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus faced Jerusalem. And in Luke, the uh, um, account there, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to the place where the mission would be accomplished. Jesus had a stone face. Now, that's not in the context that we would use stone face in our society today by taking some sort of substance and getting stoned. It was that he, <laughs> that he had a stony face. He set himself to that which he was sent. An example. Have you ever watched Westerns? I love, I love Western movies. Who are some of our Western actors, old ones? John Wayne. Clint Eastwood. Oh, Clint Eastwood. Plenty. There were heaps of them. I think Kirk Douglas did some, didn't he? And Steve McQueen. Yeah, that's right. All of these guys. But the one guy who had the stone face, I reckon, was Clint Go ahead, make my day. (laughs) There's that stony face. I love that stony face. Jesus was intent on where he was going, what he was to do, and he set his face towards exactly that, and he would not be deterred. He would not be distracted. He would not do that. It was him under the... Issue uh, under the instruction and uh, of the Father, the one who knew that God was with him in his humanity, because in his God man nature, he knew that who he was and what he had to achieve. <clears throat> when you set your face on the place and event that you are to participate in, you can't stand still, can you? You want to get there, get going, and make sure that you start to move towards. You don't mark time. Sometimes in our comfort, in our spiritual lives, I think that we start, we, we stop. I want to encourage you, encourage you to have a holy dissatisfaction for where you are. A holy dissatisfaction in your relationship with God, not in the relationship itself, but that it can go deeper. I want to encourage you that you might be a people who seek after him and seek after him and set your face like a flint and have that heart that burns within you for Jesus. Because it's so easy to mark time sometimes. And all of us in this room have done so. There's nobody exempt from that. You can't mark time. You must move. Have that holy dissatisfaction. Imagine the torment in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus knew exactly what was coming. 
when he was so intent in that prayer that sweats of bl- uh, drops of blood he sweated out of his face. For Jesus knew his goal. He knew the process. He knew the ultimate end and he knew his purpose. <coughs> How did he do that? The Lord God has opened my ear, back to Isaiah 50, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. Where we know that God is leading us, We know that God is with us and he will not put us to shame. He will not disgrace us. He will empower us to get there and he will perform that which he needs to do in us. (coughs) The New Testament says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling and we often stop there. No, no, you've got to go on. For it is God who wills and works for his good pleasure. We are here for God's good pleasure. For his glory, for his praise, to highlight him, not ourselves, to highlight him, not a church group, to highlight him, not the sign on the door. We're here to highlight Christ. We're here to highlight him. What's the purpose of your life? God has a purpose for each of you. Now, some would be saying, yeah, I've lived my purpose. Now I'm in the twilight. And that's okay, because the purpose never fails. I worked a lot on this in my life, understanding what my purpose is. Is my purpose to work as a pastor? And that's not the purpose. Is my purpose to be a chaplain? That's not the purpose. What's the why of my life? The why of this life is to walk the journey with broken and grieving people. That's the purpose for me. What's your purpose? As we sit in a time of change as PCC, Peace Christian Community, we can get confused. We can get disorientated. We can become insecure and troubled. We can question our commitment to this community even because it seems like... I don't know if I want to be around this stuff. It's unsettling. Well, remember, a holy dissatisfaction with where we're at. And normal questions. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? How will we keep going? Like what we have already. How do we keep it? How do we survive another big change? How do we do this? What is it, God, that you want for us? You know, one of the ways to answer these questions is to remember our purpose, is to remember our why. I'm going to show you something. No, I won't do that. Did I do it? Yeah. This is an illustration of something I will use when I'm mentoring a leader and uh, talking about the why of their life. You know, you speak to people and you get to know them. And uh, so tell me about yourself. Well, I do this and I do that and I do this and I do something else and this is how I do it. Isn't that how we work? We identify ourselves by the how and the what rather than the why. But I want to start with the why. The why is the important thing because I think the why is the axle around which the wheel turns. For me, the why, of course, I serve God by walking the journey with broken and grieving people. How does that happen? Well, we walk to the how. That by being a chaplain in the army cadets, by being a funeral celebrant, by just helping people along the way as, I, as the doors open, by mentoring a leader if I get the opportunity, uh, by preaching, those sorts of things, but they are spokes on the wheel. 
the why remains the same, but the spokes can change. Because one of those spokes used to be I was a pastor of a local church. And so in that sense, that spoke changed to do other things replaced by something else. But the why never changes. It's that axle around which the wheel turns. Do you get it? This is uh, an illustration I got from um, using it in an organisation. That's why the products are there. We don't have... Well, we do have products. Products are people who come to know Christ. (laughs) We just don't call them products. That's the outcomes. Deeper work with each other. Deeper work in the community. Seeing people come to connect with Jesus, even just through you. We start with the why. So today, I just want to spend just a few minutes, a little bit of background, a little bit of stimulating you, a little bit of workshopping. I did this last time, so I'll start to do it again. If you were to think what the purpose of Peace Christian Community is, what would you say? Think about the life of this community. Think about the history of this community. What are some of those things that purposes us as a local body? Glorifying God, yes. Encouragement. What about in the history of this church? There's been the broken who have come. Those who have been broken in ministry, they come for a season and then sent out again. It's a sending place. It's a receiving place. So each of us come from different backgrounds and different traditions. So it's a bit of a mishmash, a motley crew of people with lots of differences. But we hold it in tension because it's the reflection of the kingdom of God, that unshakable kingdom that we heard so well uh, spoken of last week. That was just really good, Cole. What else? Yeah, yeah, so... It's like the barracks that the soldiers go out to war and come back, they get fed, rest, and then go back out into the battlefield. It's a barracks. I think it's like a safe harbour. But it's not a safe harbour where you sit or anchor up. You come in for a time, fuel up, get provisions and go back out. And I've given you the illustration of that, haven't I, with uh, a United Methodist pastor from Mississippi that I had met. And his church uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, had about 5,000 people, I think. It was only a little place. Um, But they gave him a gift, him and his wife, a gift for all that they do in the church, and it was a cruise. Don't get your ideas. Um, (laughs) We'll give you a dinghy and shove you off out to Morton Bacon. Um, <laughs> they gave him and his wife a cruise and it was up through Norway and in that area. And they came up to, in the fjord into Oslo. And as they came to the wharf, they were in the beautiful, big, white, gleaming, shiny passenger ship, cruise liner, that pulled alongside at the wharf and he was out on the deck looking and then he saw in front of the passenger ship a dirty old ship uh, that looked cruddy, certainly wasn't a passenger ship. And uh, he stopped one of the crew members and he said, excuse me, what's that ship there? And the crew member said, that's an icebreaker. And he says, like a stupid American, I asked the next question, what does an icebreaker do? It comes from Mississippi. There's no ice there. Um, (laughs) 
And, and the crew member says, well, in the winter, the fjord can ice over and the icebreaker comes and, and breaks open a passageway into the safe harbour. And each crew member had their own job and then God spoke to him. And he said, this passenger ship is like the Western Church. It's gleaming and white and it has paid professional staff. And the, crew, the people on the cruise liner have lots of entertainment and the food is provided by the professional staff. And it sails around the ocean and around and around and around and it comes back into harbour. And the Lord spoke to him again and said, but that ship, that um, icebreaker, is like the church where every crew member has his or her job and that icebreaker breaks through the ice and allows a passage into the safe harbour and that's what I want my church to be. That's what I want my church to be. Not the cruise liner, but the icebreaker. It has no passengers, no. But the cruise liner has comfortable passengers. So that's the challenge. So what else is peace like? What is the purpose? What, what do we exist for? Yes, Patrick. Yes. So we're all the team together under the lordship of Jesus. So we come together to be his people, to minister to those who are broken, to equip each other and to even be, as I said the other day, be brother and sister sandpaper sometimes. <laughs> to rub each other up, to grind off the, the sharp edges and to become the people who God calls us to be, to reach a community, to work in our jobs, to bring church into life, not life into church. We are here to bring church into life. And so to set our faces like a flint, to set our faces to the goal of which God has called us to be, is sometimes hard is sometimes unsettling, is sometimes unnerving and causes us to be insecure. But there's only one place that we can be totally secure, as the Isaiah said, and that is in God himself. For he is the one who will not put us to shame. He is the one who will not disgrace us. He is the one who will get us to the place that we need to be. And to receive people, even though they're not like us. That's okay. We're not here to make them like us. We're here to see them become more like Jesus. So that then they will be Jesus in the places where they are. Do you get it? So as we move forward, as we divest ourselves of the structure that we meet in, and find the, pl the place and the way that God has us to be, let's do it with a face like a flint. My dad always taught me, and I love I quote this often, <clears throat> he said, always remember it's better to have a bit of backbone than wishbone. <laughs> it's true, eh? That as we move forward with our faces set where God wants us to be, we walk with backbone, not wishbone. Because wishbone's fluffy and rubbish and, yeah, it's all about facing it with Jesus. In the, in the last couple of sermons that uh, Cole preached, 
It was from Hebrews chapter 12, a beautiful chapter. Oops. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Now that is a picture in the language of a backpack filled with a heavy weight. And it, and it says, um, and the sin which so easily entangles us in that backpack. And let us, and what it's saying is throw it off. Take it off and in the language it's throw it to the ground with force. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. And let us run. Now some of you said oh, I'm just a bit past running. But that's okay. It's... <laughs> You run as the way that you do. Um, let us move forward with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Not on, the de on a denomination. Not on an institution. Not on a sign on the door. We fix our eyes on Jesus and Jesus only. The pioneer, the, the, the one who set our faith, the one who started our faith and the one who perfects our faith for the joy, listen to that, the joy set before him and endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He set his face like a flint. And as we move towards Easter... Let us renew our covenant with our Father to be his, to belong to him, to follow Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as we move ahead as PCC, our hope and trust is in God alone. For he will not put you to shame. He will not abandon us. He is with us. Let us set our faces like flints toward God and what he has for us. Let us pray. Our Father, today as we take this time and we're reminded in this period of Lent leading up to Easter, all that you have done for us, Lord Jesus. Hmm. Sometimes we easily forget. Sometimes we easily take it for granted. And sometimes we easily become lazy and just content and comfortable in where we are. Spark a new fire within us, dear God. Burn within our hearts. Help us. Give us the ability to throw off those things that entangle us, the sins, the heavy weights, the things that cause us to slow down, the things that cause us to be self-centered rather than God-centered. And help us, oh God, to set our faces like a flint, to move forward like an arrow, to going towards the bullseye, that when you shoot us out of your archer's bow, that we will reach the target that you have designed for us to reach. Not for our glory, but for yours. And God, as we come to this Easter... As we think about Palm Sunday next Sunday, remind us. Remind us all that Jesus has accomplished for us. And remind us all that he has done in himself to achieve that. And remind us of the gravity of it, oh God. And help us to be yours as we move in our workplaces in our residences in our going to the shop in our driving our cars in the words that we speak in the thoughts that we think in the steps that we take may you be glorified lord god we pray this in jesus name amen